मंगल सिंह जी को सत सत प्रणाम मंगल सिंह जी वॉज अ कलॉसस ऑफ द इंडियन शुगर इंडस्ट्री एंड अ पर्सन हु वॉज ऑलवेज एक्सप्लोरिंग न्यू आइडियाज लुकिंग एट डिफरेंट वेज ऑफ डूइंग थिंग्स ऑलवेज क्वेश्चनिंग द स्टैब्लिश प्रैक्टिस ऑफ द शुगर इंडस्ट्री एंड एक्सप्लोरिंग न्यू आइडियाज फॉर मी आई हैव हैड द ऑनर ऑफ स्पेंडिंग सेवरल आवर्स विद हिम ऑन डिस्कसिंग न्यू आइडियाज न्यू टेक्नोलॉजीज एंड ही वॉज वन हु ऑलवेज एंकरेज such thoughts and such ideas i remember at pallia there was a problem of some plugged tubes in the evaporator and he challenged me and he says come up with a solution because all the brushing all the reaming didn't clean up the tubes and we did come up with a chemical solution for doing that but purely because he encouraged us to think differently and because he set a challenge that we should do something new so i'll always be grateful to him for setting me on the path to think differently to look differently and to question everything and anything so i'll be sharing a few thoughts with you and the subject out of the box arises a lot due to the privilege that mr mangal singh gave me and us my company to think out of the box when the going gets tough the tough get going needless for me to say that this is perhaps the toughest time that the indian sugar industry is facing and looking at the projections for the next few years it would seem that with the excess production going from 32 to 35 million tons to maybe more the tough times are going to be there for some time some thoughts have been expressed yesterday on what and how to react to the situation and try to see the way ahead but as it says the tough get going so we all present here technologists agro people the engineers have to think of some tough measures that we need to take not only to save the sugar industry but to make it prosper and grow so to overcome the situation of excess in a manner that the industry can still grow so there are certain short term measures there will have to be some long term measures i'll share a few with you there are several ideas but due to the paucity of time i'll share a few with you just to get the thinking going as to what could be a few of the directions that the industry could possibly take why have a boiler or a turbine for that matter now this would seem to be a stupid question because for 90 years it has given us the answer that you need the boiler and turbine for steam and power and every sugar mill 
follows this that they have a boiler and turbine but can this situation be different and i would propose that it can as far as the requirement of power is concerned now the situation is different from what it was when the sugar mills were established in the villages etc and the country was always short of power we all have grown up under those circumstances where there was always shortage of power and then it was obvious that the best step forward is for the sugar mill to have its own power and then of course the steam that is required for the process however the situation is different today there is plenty of power availability prices are pretty low the prices are coming down lower and lower as you would have seen in the case of solar and wind power and from the grid and the energy exchange power availability is very good fortunately the sugar season is during winters when the power rates are generally lower than what they are let's say in may june and july so it would be worthwhile to have a look if the power is taken from the grid and the power plant in the sugar mill is not required backup power of course for critical functions has to be there but that will be just backup power that's the price trend from the exchange you can see towards the end of the graph what the picture is from october to march april and you would see that the prices are quite low and today with open access sugar mills if they choose to do this can negotiate very good power prices with the exchange energy exchange as far as steam is concerned we have boilers installed anywhere from 63 to 125 bar but what we really need for process steam in the factory is only 1.25 bar steam or let's say 1.5 bar steam so of course those 125 bar boilers were set up to get the maximum out of the power generation and that made a lot of sense but if we do away with the boiler then all we need is this 1.25 bar and i'm sure everybody here can quickly calculate that there will be very very little amount of gas that will be required to generate steam at 1.25 bar pressure so what will that do to us what will that do to the sugar industry they'll reduce the plant cost by 100 crores and all the finance experts and the sugar mills can quickly calculate how much that would contribute to the bottom line with respect to savings interest and depreciation manpower maintenance pollution ash disposal what have you so there would be advantages of doing that so the question arises what to do with all the bagas because if you are not running a power plant and you are using very little bagas to run that minimal quantity of steam requirement then all the bagas is excess and where does that go because if so much of bagas is available in the market then obviously the prices will drop and it would not be remunerative for the sugar mills to be selling bagas now bagas is a pretty versatile raw material and it will have it has many uses you would have been hearing of 2g ethanol but beyond 2g ethanol there are many other things you can make methanol you can make dimethyl ether you can make syngas there are you can make bio cng there are many things possible with bagas and more or less most of these technologies 
are available and commercial today. I'll just take you off what to do with Bagasse on one particular example instead of trying to discuss 10 different biofuels. Sunlight Fuels is setting up a factory in UP to convert Bagasse into biofuels. And these biofuels are commonly known and technically known also as drop-in fuels. So these drop-in fuels basically are actual petrol and actual diesel which will be manufactured to BS6 norms so that they can be sold easily. Also, <coughs> these biofuels have the advantage that you don't have to change any of the infrastructure, meaning the petrol pumps, the distribution channels, everything is there in place. So you don't need to change any infrastructure and the biofuels, the actual petrol and diesel can be sold. I'm using the word actual just to differentiate from biodiesel, from bioethanol, which are all used for blending. So as is everybody knows today, all the ethanol or the bioethanol is being sold to the oil marketing companies and they have to blend it and then it becomes a part of the petrol. But here what I'm talking about is producing from bagasse, actual petrol and actual diesel. Um, this plant will be the world's first such plant. It will be using 1,000 tons per day of bagasse. I'll so 1,000 tons per day of bagasse will give you 200,000 liters of petrol and diesel. And the value addition very quickly, I mean, these are quick numbers. So one ton of bagasse, if you value it at 2,400 rupees, which I think is a reasonable price to assume, will give you 200 liters of biofuel at 60 rupees a liter, gives you 12,000 rupees. So you have a value multiplication factor of one is to five which is far, far, far more than what you get out of cogen. And just a small thing on the current petrol and diesel prices, of course, they keep changing. They could drop, they could increase. So 60 rupees price that I'm talking about is still within the range that petrol and diesel get sold at. And very soon we will have these under the GST regime, in which case, then they can be sold directly, maybe even at a higher price. Of course, it depends on the crude prices. And from the market point of view, there's unlimited demand for petrol and diesel. It gives energy security for the country because you reduce the crude import. It reduces the greenhouse gas emission. And of course, then we have petrol and diesel made in India as against from imported crude oil. Energy security based on clean and reliable sources is essential for India's future. I must say and appreciate the current government is very, very encouraging towards biofuels. They are very proactive and also some of these states have put up their biofuel policies, UP for example, where they are giving a lot of incentives for putting up biofuel plants. Just to give you a picture of the universe, that out of 150 million kiloliters per annum of petrol and diesel consumed in the country, from bagasse, that is, I'm taking all the bagasse that is there, of course, all of it is not going to be used, but I just want to show what the potential is. And since bagasse is a seasonal availability, so you have only 150 to 160 days of bagasse. And if I use other biomass, because the process technology is agnostic to the biomass, it could be bagasse, it could be anything else, then you have possibility of 62 million kiloliters per annum. And so the sugar industry can meet 40% of India's petrol and diesel requirements. This may seem a bit high, but the idea is to get thinking on the subject. So sugar refinery, will have a completely different meaning. 
it will become a sugar plus petroleum refinery which produces sugar as well as petrol and diesel. That's the diagram for the process technology. Anybody wants to discuss, I can discuss later on what the process technology is. But important thing out here that I would like to point out, perhaps maybe you can see on your screens, that there is a biochar produced as a residue of the process, and this biochar has a calorific value of 8,000 kcal per kg, and it, can be, it will be used for the steam that we talked about previously of 1.25, 1.5 kg pressure steam that we needed for the process. That biochar will be more than enough to produce that steam that is required. And again, of course, in our model also, and for this particular project, we are taking power from the grid, and we have not put a captive power plant. Just for your information, Indian Oil has recently installed a 30,000 crore petroleum refinery where they are taking power from the grid and they have not put a captive power plant. And I'm informed from the energy exchange that many such plants now are taking the power from the grid and doing away with setting up captive power plants. We move on to another subject. Just have a look at this video. Yeah. Excuse me. Can we have this video going, please? Then plug the batter into the... So what you saw out there is sugar or let's say a sugar syrup being used for making polyurethane foam. You all know polyurethane foam. You're sitting on polyurethane foam on the cushions that you're sitting on right now. And as one example that was shown in the video was for chappals made from polyurethane foam. Or you can have various, many, many uses, including insulation, which is a major use for polyurethane. And polyurethane, Basically, in the simplistic form, is a polyol and an isocyanate. And one of the large sources of polyol that we all know is sugar. So this whole experiment, and this, which, which is commercial now, it is no longer an experiment, is of making polyurethane foam from sugar, which is being used as a polyol. You all know, or perhaps some of you know, about the success story of India Glycol, where they made ethanol from molasses, monoethylene glycol, MEG from ethanol, and that MEG was used to make PET bottles for Pepsi and Coke, and India Glycol earned tons and tons of money selling that as a green chemical input. So today, there is, in the world, a lot of demand for green chemicals and sugar. Nothing could be greener than sugar because you're getting it from sugar cane, which is a sustainable crop, and use that for one example that I have given you for polyurethane. So it's sugar syrup. MDI, which is methylene diisocyanate, plus water, plus foaming agent. You can add color, and you get a polyurethane of different densities, which are very low, and which gives it a good cell structure to give it the properties of insulation and the jumpiness, or let's say the cushioning. Familiar molecule for all of us here. You see the two marked red. Those 
or the hydroxyl groups which go into the reaction, which make this into a polyol to react with the isocyanate. Let's see it, look at the economics. So uh, this is a very rough calculation. Uh, for the polyurethane that is made using sugar as the polyol, it's roughly 30% of sugar. So one kg of sugar gives you 3.3 kgs of PU foam, which I've just done a small calculation. If we looked at the example of chappals, which we saw in the video, will give you 30 kilos of, say, if the price of sugar gives you 5,000 rupees worth of end product. So that's a value multiplication of 170 times, which I think is pretty reasonable and will definitely contribute to the bottom line of the sugar mills if this is taken up as one of the directions which uses sugar, reduces the availability of sugar in the market, thereby increasing the sugar prices. We are all looking at ways, we are talking of exports of sugar, we are talking of doing things with sugar. So here is one example that I just wanted to place before you of what to do with sugar. Okay, let's move on to another thing, water wars. Again, it's the hot topic, it's the burning topic. It is a very, very important topic for not only us, for sugar industry, for India, for the entire world, water is going to be one of the <coughs> least available material and is getting less and less supply of water. So where does the sugar industry come into this? Again, I'll give you a, again, I mean, we all know that sugar cane is 70% water, but only thing that we need to do is to recover that water. Today, there are a lot and lot of sugar mills that are extracting water from the ground through bore wells, putting it there, and then literally, literally letting millions of liters of water go down the drain. So what I propose and what I'm requesting everybody to think about is how to conserve this water, how to recover it. We have the technology, Chemical Systems has the technology for recovering all the water, how to stop bore well drawing of water. So just a simple calculation, 10,000 TCD factory for 160 days, and if you sell the water that is recovered at one rupee a liter, <coughs> and that 80 crores of rupees per season. Of course, when you see that bottle of water there, and you pay 12 to 15 rupees for one liter of water, one rupee a liter does not seem much. Of course, there will be challenges, but some of those could be met by, for example, co-locating a Pepsi or a Coke factory at a sugar mill. Instead of sugar mill just buying the sugar, they could be also buying water from the sugar mill. And there are, I don't think at the end of 2018, 19 sugar, or let's say the April, March or the sugar year, there would be very many companies, sugar companies, whether they be the large ones, whether they be the small ones, whether they be the government ones, that would have 80 crores as their net profit at the end of the season because of the situation that the sugar industry is on right now. So that's just one another little help to the situation. Deriving water out of the sugar cane, which is already entering the sugar mill. A few other thoughts. One which I feel very strongly about, and I'm surprised that ISMA did not include this in the recommendations that they've recently submitted to the government of having a differential price of 60 rupees a kilo or whatever price, 55, 60, 65, it's not important what the number is, but the thought 
and the idea is more important for the industrial user because 75% of the sugar is bought by industry, 70-75%, and it's only the 20-25% that's going into domestic. And having fixed the price at 31 rupees by the government, what is stopping them from fixing a price of 60 rupees a kilo for industrial users? Because your Mithai wala doesn't really care if the price goes to him from 30 to 60 rupees, he will increase his price of Mithai from 300 to 400 rupees. Coca-Cola is already charging you maybe 40 times what is going into the sugar into the actual Coca-Cola to the price that they are charging for per liter of Coca-Cola. So this will definitely improve the economics and I think we should, if we agree to this, we should all urge the government that this move be taken, that a price for industrial users be fixed. I've been talking to Ikrisat at Hyderabad, where they have developed new varieties of sorghum, and now they believe that there is a possibility and that they have enough proof of sorghum being planted, and then that be used for three, four months, maybe just for producing ethanol, because today, ethanol, again, is an unlimited demand, current, Supply of ethanol is less than 4.2% to the petroleum companies, OMCs, whereas it is mandated to be 10%. It could go up to 20% under the national biofuel policy, which came out just a month ago. So it's an unlimited demand for ethanol. And then you utilize your capex, which is lying idle for six to seven months in a year to use sorghum. Of course, it has to be seen whether there is plenty of plantation area around, some places there may be, some places there may not be. The other is about <coughs> sugar consumption. I don't think we have ever marketed sugar. We have sold sugar, we have sold sugar through distributors, but there is, I don't see any company that has really gone out to sell sugar or any effort from ISMA for that matter to go and sell sugar and see the consumption. I mean, I'm quite surprised that over the last four years, or five years, six years, I've been hearing this figure that it is 23, 24, 25 million tons, and that figure is not changing by more than 2% a year, where the population itself is growing, the purchasing power is growing, the consumption is growing. You can see by the number of ice cream parlors that you see in the, every city. So something needs to be done, and it's only the industry that can do it because we are the most interested party. Then, again, there is no effort on countering the negative propaganda on sugar. It's called white poison. They say there should be a sin tax on it. And, I mean, surprisingly, the disease, or let's say the diabetes, now everybody calls it sugar, nobody calls it diabetes. So, I, I mean, it sounds like a small point, but you can imagine the negativeness that it creates into the mind of people when instead of hearing diabetes, they hear the disease as sugar. And then of course everybody keeps from sugar, and then how can the consumption increase? Lastly, I would say for the export of refined sugar, we are talking of 8 million tons of export, and this is going to be for a few more years. So it would make far more sense to export refined sugar instead of raw sugar, because currently what I'm hearing from the industry is the export of raw sugar. But if you export refined sugar, then you get something like 350 rupees a bag extra after meeting all the costs that would entail for refining sugar. So the country earns more, the sugar factory earns more, so it is a win-win situation for both. And the differential in the refined sugar price and the raw sugar price, even right now, is about $80. And that, on a historic average, has been $65. So I've taken a figure of about $50 after taking $15 as the cost, and that would translate to something like 350 rupees a bag. 
So I would like to make one appeal, and especially since this is to honor Mr. Mangal Singh, and I said right at the beginning that he was, he inspired all of us to think differently, think new, think fresh. So lastly, I would end with a request to especially the owners, the general managers, the presidents of the company, that for the six months of the off season, when you have your brilliant sugar technologists, engineers, sitting there with little work to do, please encourage them, ask them, and make it an institutional change that they look at literature on bagasse and sugar, on what possibilities are there of those being used, and then slowly think towards translating them into commercial ideas. Inventing is good, implementing is more important. Thank you. Excellent.